believe that we are already on. <laughs> are we on? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much to all of you for attending this online session about emerging donors and philanthrocapitalism. I'm very sure that many critical issues will arise and that we may be able to reach very relevant conclusions. I deeply encourage participants to comment on Twitter using the hashtag HCBerlin. And you are also welcome to comment and post any questions or comments you may have in the chat bar on the right. Uh, let me as well mention the accessibility features. The international sign uh, is to be found in the session area and the live uh, captioning, uh, the link is to be found in the reception area as well. And if there are any other questions, there is a help desk available uh, in the session area. So we have the pleasure to have here with us uh, three experts in the subject. Uh, let me briefly introduce each of our speakers today. Uh, we have uh, Dalila Madawi. Hi, Dalila, how are you? Hi there, how are you, Susanna? Hi. Uh, Dalila is a media communications and press specialist now working at the International Transport Workers Federation based in London. Uh, but she has worked for many international organizations such as uh, MSF for Save the Children traveling around the world, including emergencies and conflict areas like the Rohingya crisis. As a journalist, she collaborates with the BBC World Service, Dutch Well, The Guardian, among many, many others. So thank you very much for being here today, Dalila. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. We have as well uh, John Pringle. Hi, John. Hello. Hi. John is a nurse and uh, epidemiologist uh, with a PhD in public health and bioethics. He's assistant professor at McGill University in Montreal, member as well uh, of the MSF Ethics Review Board and member of the Humanitarian Health Ethics Research Group. He has done four missions with uh, MSF, including, for example, Nigeria and Sierra Leone during the Ebola crisis. His research is at the intersection of global health, humanitarian action, and bioethics. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Thanks very much. It's nice to be here. <laughs> I wish I was in Berlin, though, but this is fine. Yeah, this is fine. <laughs> Hopefully next year. <laughs> and finally, we have with us uh, James Love. How are you, James? I'm, I'm doing well. Thank you. Hi. James Love uh, is Director of uh, Knowledge Ecology International at Washington. He's advisor of UN agencies, national governments, as well as international organizations and public health NGOs. Uh, he holds masters in public administration and in public affairs as well. And his current focus is on the financing of research and development, intellectual property rights, prices for and access to new drugs, vaccines and other medical technologies, among many others. Thank you very much for being here, James. Thank you. I'm sure the debate and the discussion is, is going to be very alive with these three experts we have the pleasure to be uh, with. And just uh, a very brief uh, introduction to our debate and to put it in, in context. Uh, in the name of humanitarian action, Philanthrocapitalism have played an essential role in tailoring the new narrative around global health and medicine. Uh, the neoliberal and free market vision that drives the key players in the philanthropic sector has helped shape up a new political culture that is increasingly driven to the commodification of humanitarianism, healthcare, and social services, and make it a distance from the domain that they constitutionally belong to, that are the human rights domain. No? The question here is, what are the risks if governmental or institutional policies are not driven by, let's say, its legal and moral obligation to serve and protect people, but are heavily influenced by profit gains of private companies? This is the issue we will try to go through uh, here today. So let's start with an opening question to all of our panelists. Uh, in your opinion, what is the philanthropist's role in the political and economic framework 
that generates humanitarian action. And let's start for Dalila, for example. Sure. Well, thank you for the question. Um, undoubtedly, philanthropy uh, plays a very important role in humanitarian work. But increasingly, I would argue that philanthropy's role in the humanitarian sector has become toxic and it dilutes the notion of humanitarian, of principled humanitarian action. We have more philanthropists than ever before, and yet we also have far more inequality. The top 1% of the world continue to fatten themselves on the backs of the working class and the outright poor. Um, as Paul Vallely has said, philanthropy is always an expression of power. A lot of elite philanthropy is about elite causes, he says. Rather than making the world a better place, it largely enforces the world as it is. It often favors the rich through favorable taxation um, and through their own pet projects and initiatives, and there's little, little accountability or transparency. So our solution to systemic injustice and, and, and inequity that humanitarians we try to address um, it cannot be to turn to financial elites and philanthropists or plutocrats. We need really to focus on creating more equitable societies. But what we have now is a humanitarian sector that enables the wealthy to launder somewhat sordid and even criminal reputations through philanthropy. Um, Inand Gerderas calls it generosity masquerading as justice. People make the argument, well, isn't it better just to take their money and to save lives than to let people die? The idea of win-win. But this framing of the discussion does nothing to address the underlying injustices facing populations. And it, in itself, it adopts the language of capitalism to the issues of social change and social justice. And of course, the kinds of actions that would lead to positive change in the first place are the actions that donors would lose out from. So. Um, essentially, I, I don't think that uh, philanthropy can play a, a good role in, in uh, humanitarian action. What we're, what we're moving to is a privatization of the solutions to pro public problems, as Gerda has said. Um, and we start to see the people who uh, are causing our problems as our saviors. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think, John? What is your general view about this uh, philanthropy thing? Uh Thank you, Sid. Given that the theme is uh, of this conference is exposing power and privilege, I just would like um, to make it a land acknowledgement um, that I am on unceded indigenous lands. The Joje Gay Nation is recognized as a custodian of the land and waters where Montreal is situated. So I just want to acknowledge that. Uh, so, wow, D Delila said everything I would have. Uh, would have wanted to have said uh, it, it's fantastic that we're taking a critical lens right off the bat. And even um, the background paper for this, for those who have read it, um, is really quite eloquent about a critique of philanthro capitalism. I see it uh, as part of the bigger capitalist project. Um, and I think that um, the question is, you know, about its role. Well, its role is what uh, philanthropic capitalists say its role is. Um, we don't have control and power over that. Uh, I think, you know, I don't think the philanthropic capitalists are trembling in their boots right now that we're discussing them critically. Uh, I think they're very indifferent to what uh, humanitarian organizations may have to say about them. This is part of a, a huge um, source of power that is embedded deeply in, in the neoliberal globalization project in disaster capitalism. Uh, they'll work through us, they'll work around us. And I think the dangers cannot be overstated. Um, so I think um, uh, it's very crucial that we situate it historically because this is not new. We have seen, uh, we have seen the likes of uh, Rockefeller, Carnegie, Mellon, uh, and the world, the, the play, the role they played in start, um, the mandate of the World Health Organization. These are, are huge powers uh, that continue anew uh, in late stage capitalism. And so I think we have a tremendous duty, not just as humanitarians, but as just human beings that are part of this planet to, to speak out and say uh, and highlight the uh, damage 
that this whole broader system is doing to the populations that we serve and that we can witness this in the work that we do and convey this through advocacy and témoignage. Mm -hmm. Thank you, John. Uh, what do you think, James? Do you agree with the statements that Dalila and John are making here? <laughs> Uh, James, we cannot hear you. Maybe I, I, I would say that my own argument, uh, you know, you, uh, John started out with some uh, discussion and disclosure of, of his own, own organization. I know that my organization is is really exists because we've benefited from some philanthropy. Uh, so I, I just want to be uh, acknowledge that, and uh, and I think that. Uh, uh, groups like Oxfam and MSF, which have also played a really important role in global health, uh, have also benefited from both small and large mm -hmm. philanthropy. I think that one of the challenges you have are, are when you have a, uh, 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 a disproportionate power coming from private charities, and sometimes uh, they may be reflected in ideology that is not consistent with what's really uh, best for human rights, or there even can be some conflicts of interest in some cases. And I think that's one of the things that's it's good to, to examine. Yeah, I, I work a lot with the World Health Organization, as well as other uh, Geneva-based institutions, such as the Global Fund for uh, HIV, uh, AIDS, uh, uh, HIV, AIDS, uh, malaria, and tuberculosis. I don't know if I got the order right. <laughs> um, uh, with uh, Unitaid, with uh, sometimes we work uh, occasionally, uh, we try and work with the World Bank uh, l less often, but uh, uh, the, the, what, there's one institution in particular, the, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which has become uh, as an outsized influence on those, those institutions. And they, they, they actually serve in the board of the Global Fund and of institutions like Unitaid, and they have a special role with the World Bank, and they they uh, become like such a massive donor to the to the World Health Organization, and both, both through their own money and money they control through the Buffett Foundation, which is another very big source of money. And to this, to the extent that if the Gates Foundation wants to weigh in on, a, on an issue that they care about, it's very difficult for other voices to really be heard. And the particular cons, uh, conflicts we have, uh, there, there's many things the Gates Foundation does that we agree with. And, and, and we think are beneficial. But there's areas that uh, many of us disagree with. And in particular, uh, on the issue of intellectual property rights and the control of uh, know-how and knowledge, the uh, Gates Foundation has for some time, I, I really saw this initially in 1999, it's began to sort of use its resources and its prestige to uh, strengthen the power of, of, of big pharma companies, in particular, big vaccine manufacturers to maintain as tight a control over the uh, patent rights and rights and data and control of know-how as possible, even, even when the money is coming from the public sector. So in the current pandemic with COVID-19, you see uh, uh, billions and billions of dollars coming from governments that are going to vaccine manufacturers. And the, the Gates Foundation has intervened in this process very clearly to push for a, a set of exclusive agreements among companies and a, a fair amount of secrecy relating to manufacturing know-how. So despite the fact that in some cases the, the governments are paying for the building of factories, uh, transferring the intellectual property in some cases, funding the inventions uh, and purchasing the products in some and, and, and in many cases in advance of the products even being registered through advanced purchase agreements, there's not much of a movement to open source the know-how and the rights and data and patents, even though the companies that are, they're, they're controlling all this government funded vaccine technology cannot meet demand globally. So you, we're gonna have even more inequality of access and even a slower rollout of vaccines than is necessary because of this hoarding of the know-how and the intellectual property, which is, uh, which I think is, is because of the the ideological approach that that Bill Gates has taken to this, and it's not really challenged very effectively, because people want Bill Gates's money, or they want Warren Buffett's money that that he controls. There are some other institutions that are stepping up. 
he, he initially crowded out a lot of other donors in the area uh, that used to work in this space because they thought Bill Gates was had so much money that they, they, they didn't need to engage. But there are some other institutions like the Zuckerberg Foundation, the Wellcome Trust in the UK, the uh, 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 Bloomberg does some things in other areas of public health, such as smoking uh, control and things like that. There, there can be important. We're really disappointed that the Wellcome Trust has not maintained a sufficient amount of independence from the uh, from the Gates Foundation on these matters involving intellectual property, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Uh, please, each of you, uh, feel free to answer or comment any of the questions the rest of the speakers are raising. Uh, Dalila, um, related to this, is it possible to stay true to principled humanitarian action, looking at the capital they bring into the sector? Or are the humanitarian organizations just the executive arms of these private interests? This is related to one of the questions we have in our audience that is actually asking the basically the same question, no? What is your alternative solution for funding humanitarian action if we cannot opt for the win-win solution no, of taking money? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, is it possible to stay true to humanitarian principles and take money from plutocrats? Uh, I'm not so sure. I think uh, many NGOs have largely gone along with the capitalist imperative of constant growth. And so we've seen NGOs uh, attract more money, grow bigger, grow their headquarters, grow their, their staff at headquarters, increase their bureaucracy, and generally become much more self-interested. So in other words, NGOs have started to care more about self-preservation than in taking radical action to address the root causes of injustice. Um, and I think uh, for me, the recent um, uh, donation that MSF accepted from BlackRock, a company with $7.4 trillion under its belt, highlights uh, this conundrum quite well. At the time, I said that uh, taking that money was like taking, was like doing a deal with the devil. Um, but this is not about one or two bad apples in a philanthropy barrel. This is about the whole barrel being rotten. The whole concept of monopoly capital and philanthropic capitalism is rotten. Um, in other words, the, the social justices, social injustices and harm wrought by plutocrats in their pursuit of power um, is what we need to be looking at. So in my view, when humanitarians take money from big business, they might as well be agreeing to the dismantling of taxation, of regulation, the destruction of the environment, and so on. Companies do not care about people. They care about profit, and they will act in order to secure the most profit. So pretending that they have the public interest at heart when they make donations like this, I think is fickle. We live um, in an era of gross inequality, and those inequalities, as we are seeing in the COVID pandemic, are only growing worse by the day. So when NGOs take money from people committing those injustices, they become part of the machinery of harm too. Hannah Arendt spoke um, about the banality of evil and for the need uh, for a rethink about ideas of moral responsibility. I think the humanitarian sector needs to have an honest conversation about the banality of evil in humanitarian fundraising. <laughs> NGOs who become uh, dependent on plutocrats or monopoly capital to fund their activities have lost, in my view, their moral authority. Um, and every decision to take big money from big business is an operational decision that perpetuates the roots of injustice. As for how we can, um, uh, you know, what alternative solutions there are for funding humanitarian action. Let's go back to our, our original principles and, and our, our original modeling uh, for fundraising, which was to, to look at smaller, uh, uh, smaller individual donations, money that is not um, tainted in the same way as money from BlackRock, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. John wants to add something no, to, yes, sure. to the question raised. Yeah, and um, you know we can we we can all discuss the motivations of these uh, capitalists and 
Um, and nobody can know really what their motivations are. Imagine their multiple motivations, uh, but it's, uh, I think it's really irrelevant. Uh, we have to look at the political economy of the humanitarian sector and how it's, it's changing. Um, so I just drew from the MSF um, uh, financial report. Um, and, you know, MSF is a, is a strong organization, a principled organization. Uh, MSF doesn't take money from pharmaceutical or biotechnology companies, extraction industries, tobacco companies, or our manufacturers. And that uh, most of its, almost all of its funding are, is from individual donors and private institutions. So MSF is in a privileged position where many other organizations are not. They um, ha have to take money where they can get it. And what's happening in the capitalist marketplace, humanitarian organizations are competing for market share. Uh, we have to compete with each other uh, to win the hearts and minds of donors so that we can implement our projects and uh, and come out on top. So we end the same game, and in doing so, we often inadvertently simplify the uh, humanitarian crises that we're responding to to make them seem that, well, your money can solve this problem and that uh, through your uh, we can address this crisis. And it creates this, this real false impression that these are ahistorical, um, depoliticized crises uh, and, uh, and, then, uh, and that I think we do have a duty and an obligation to add nuance and complexity. And I see that's happening more and more, um, including with conferences like this. Yeah, I see. I see. Uh, James, related to, to this, um, at a time when private corporate players have been directly convened into implementing the 2030 Agenda and its Sustainable Development Goals, and with all this COVID context that has changed completely the global agenda, uh, what kind of measures are required to clarify the rules of the game? Well, I think one thing that is important is that there would be far more transparency in the health area of, of uh, decision-making processes and documents that are related to the, the COVID pandemic. Right now, uh, the contracts from donors, both government and private sector uh, uh, donors are, are secret. So we don't really have the terms of those agreements. And uh, a lot of the data that you'd like, you'd, like, you'd like to have on issues, everything from prices to, uh, to uh, outcomes from clinical trials to, uh, to the, the licenses that are involved or the, or the procurement contracts are just really extremely difficult to get. And so there should be a greater amount of, of transparency. I think it used to be uh, the, the grants that the that the uh, some of these large foundations do should also be subject to more more transparency. Um, and and uh, some of these foundations are so big you, you can't really look at them anymore as um, as just some small neighborhood charity. I mean, they're, they, they, the Gates Foundation has more power in setting the global trade agenda than almost any country. Uh, and, uh, you know, if there's, if they're giving more money than most countries give, or in, in some years, all, any country, um, uh, but they're not subject to Freedom of Information Acts or any, 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 any sort of accountability of the governance or anything like that. And one of the ways that they that we've we've objected to the way things have have, have happened with the with the uh, Gates Foundation is that they will provide some kind sometimes in kind services of consulting firms, particularly the McKinsey Group and uh, I mean the, the uh, McKinsey and uh, the Boston Consulting Group to the World Health Organization or to other Geneva based uh, health institutions or to the World Bank or whatever. And so these. Uh, these consulting groups like McKinsey, for example, Boston Consulting also work for vaccine manufacturers and drug manufacturers. They have a very diverse clients. And so uh, uh, McKinsey, for, for example, was one of the outfits that was advising governments to shut down their nationally uh, owned uh, vaccine manufacturing and rely entirely on the private sector, telling them that they didn't really need to be 
manufacturing vaccines themselves. They could just depend upon the private sector. And that, and they were also advising companies on mergers that led to a lot of consolidation in the vaccine manufacturing area. Mm -hmm. and now you've got uh, the Gates Foundation telling people not to worry about the patents that exist in the manufacturing area because they say even if you dealt with the patents, you wouldn't really have access to the underlying know-how. And you wouldn't be able to take advantage of the freedom if you if you broke the patent monopolies because you'd still be this monopoly on the know-how uh, and, and other areas. And it's it's really moved in a wrong direction. So uh, uh, we 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 have we have wanted uh, uh, a deeper conflict of interest policy at the World Health Organization as it relates to consulting firms, and we 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 just don't get them. Like there's no. There's no uh, document you can find that really sets out the conflicts of interest. For example, McKinsey or Boston Consultants thing have with their private sector con conflicts. It's just sort of people don't go there. And uh, uh, so I think s s some of the things you want, transparency, paying attention to conflict of interest. There is this question is, can you really regulate uh, uh, these partnerships that you see evolving between private foundations and companies and UN agencies or health agencies or even governments. And, uh, you know, we haven't given up on the idea that you can regulate things, but we have to be candid about the failures of regulation in this area and the, and, and just the, 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 the inability. The other thing on, 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 on power, like we work on global uh, MSF, Health Action International, Third World Network. A lot of our groups work on these global health issues. And then there's these, uh, uh, the Gates Foundation has populated the global health area with a whole lot of organizations that they fund, like the Center for Global Development, for example, is a big voice because they have a huge budget, results for development, gets a lot of money from the Gates Foundation. And so they'll put out uh, uh, a consistent amount of information to policymakers, which pushes things in a certain direction. So what John was talking about is you're trying to get your voice heard. There's a crowding out or there's a, competition uh, in, in, the, uh, in the debate space for certain ideas. And civil society is often represented by groups, basically represented by the Microsoft founder and not by you know, more grassroots type organizations. Or they'll invent their own sort of grassroots type, you know, sort of, I wouldn't say, I don't know if astroturfs is the right way, but they're not really, really, uh, they're following a, cert, a certain line. So that, that in the global health area has actually been uh, a significant thing when it uh, when it when it comes to sort of uh, in the in the UN discussions uh, that have taken place in some of these areas, the the NCD Alliance has been the, the group that's had the biggest uh, uh, voice in the area, and that's funded by uh, drug companies and the yeah. Gates Foundation, basically. Yeah. And uh, so, of course, they're not going to like challenge the drug companies on patents on cancer drugs and or prices on cancer drugs in developing countries in the same way. Uh, that other groups would, but because they, you know, they, they get such massive resources, they become part of the partnership model uh, that you have. And so uh, uh, there's even been a, a different attempt in WHO to give uh, 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 private companies and big foundations actually voting power and seats on the executive board or the, the, the governance circuit. And that hasn't really happened, but there was a, a push for that, a push for that to say, and that's actually what you see in, in the uh, in the global fund. The global fund actually has positions for the industry and the private sector foundations. Unitate has a, a, an open slot that the Gates Foundation is thing where they actually vote in the same way that governments vote on the policies there. So uh, uh, it, it's I think in one sense they, they, the feeling was they could exercise their influence through the donation activity, but there's an there's an aspiration to actually have seats on the board. Where you're actually casting votes on uh, personnel, budgets, things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, related to this, uh, let me ask you, John, as uh, your expert in, in global health, uh, and related to, to what James has just uh, said, is there a, a possible way to uh, mitigate the influence of these private interests on the healthcare and public health agendas? Um. Yes. Uh, um, well, I suppose so. I think the onus is going going to be on people that are working in the field and that have the the legitimacy to uh, speak out on the um, not just the ethical but the substantive issues 
uh, as James has been describing them. And James, you have an, uh, some incredible insight um, from, from your vantage point. Um, and I'm wondering if there's, if you see a distinction between a developmentalism, uh, strengthening health systems versus what we think of contemporary humanitarianism, which is more emergency response. Um, and, uh, and what I'm drawing attention to is the, the, the history where um, developmentalism fell out of favor um, after the, uh, with the erosion of the Bretton Woods Agreement um, and the um, Volcker shock and the third world debt crisis uh, where um, neoliberalism really took a foothold and uh, abandoned the needs of the poor to, um, to um, sort of niche humanitarian organizations that can just sort of mop up the mess. Uh, and James um, and, and Delila too, I, I'm wondering if you're, uh, if you see a distinction with philanthrocapitalism and developmentalism and humanitarianism, or is this all being merged into one sort of common charitable packet, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> uh, there's a lot, a lot to unpack there, but uh, uh, I think that uh, one thing, just to sort of take a little contrarian position here, uh, I think the, 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 there's strong evidence that the international trade uh, and, and, and private sector investment and capitalism in general has been a positive thing in terms of raising the income levels in states. If you look at the economic progress in India, for example, and other countries, uh, it's, it's been impressive what, what, uh, what's happened in the last few years in terms of per capita income standings and things like that. So I think that there's a sort of this sort of strong justification for for uh, for 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 sort of this this sort of liberal, neoliberal trade agenda on, on, on the one hand, but everything is really a, a question about uh, balance and and power too. So that uh, there's some obvious measures that should be taking place. Uh, they're they're pro development that aren't taking place because of the uh, not not everyone that's playing the game is doing it with everyone else's interest in mind. They're usually the perception is. There's some things are zero sum by people, and so they really push for their national interest. On the vaccine front, uh, clearly, we think that that not just for this particular emergency, but going forward and in general, uh, the, the 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 sensible global strategy be would be to eliminate the concentration in vaccine manufacturing and develop more know-how and capacity in more countries. So it isn't just like in Europe or the United States or something like that. It, it should it should be more widely distributed and prices should be lower and things like that. And so that if there's a, the next pandemic, it, it doesn't, it doesn't turn out like this one is where you have these things like COVAX and stuff, which are very limited uh, uh, ways of dealing with the inequality of access to the vaccines. Uh, 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 but, but I, you know, I, 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 I do, I do understand why some people would defend Trade liberalization is a positive thing for countries, um, and and you know I just have to I, I think we have to be we have to concede some of the areas where uh, where the activities of private investment in the market has been a, a positive thing for lifting living standards, but also uh, also the opposite. I mean, look, look at the areas where it does create these big gaps in inequality, and 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 also where the political power associated with the firms that are in control of the money biases the, the, the other policies and undermines them so that we have, uh, uh, it, you know, it's not a, that's that problem. You're not, you're not at a quarter solution. You're in somewhere in the middle and uh, with unequal power in terms of how, how things, how things are discussed. I think that the focus on this, on describing uh, uh, the influence and power of people that have the money at any given point in a, in, in a discussion in the creation and, and, and validation of, of evidence, for example, uh, and the marshalling of, of experts and things like that is something that is, is, is I'm glad that this, this conference is talking about that because that is, that really needs to be elevated. Mm -hmm. 
I, my next question to Darila is related to this this topic of the liberal free markets uh, maybe being uh, useful for development. There is also some uh, people in the audience uh, asking the same things. Uh, Dalila, uh, can the role uh, that philanthropic organizations are currently playing in the humanitarian action represent maybe a crisis of legitimation of the state, of the official development aid, of the UN, and therefore of the way things traditionally have been done by, by, by NGOs? I mean, isn't it showing our our failure in a way? Because uh, James mentioned no, that, that there are many that think that free market and the model of uh, capitalism can bring more efficiency to the humanitarian action. No? What, what do you think about this? Yeah, that's a that's a really interesting question, um, and I think certainly the fact that some NGOs like MSF uh, don't take money from governments has inadvertently perhaps helped erode the idea that governments shouldn't be the first port of call in protecting uh, populations under their, their, their duty of care. Um, certainly uh, in today's era, we're seeing a rollback in the role and the importance of governments and states. And uh, that space is, is increasingly being yielded to big corporations. Um, and yes, indeed, today we have many corporations that are much more powerful than governments. Just go to back to BlackRock. Uh, their, their, their financial assets are twice the GDP of France or Italy. So considerably more powerful um, an actor. So I think um, humanitarians need to rethink the way that they interact with companies and philanthropists with, um, who, who wield that much power. Um, and as I said before, I think the, gr the growing reliance on philanthrop capitalists speaks to a global collective failure to stem the rise of monopolized uh, capital um, at the expense of global well-being. So if we want to really demonstrate solidarity with the people that we are meant to be assisting, perhaps the, the braver thing uh, would be to, to refuse donations like that or to use them as opportunities to, to speak out um, about uh, how those companies or philanthropists have contributed to the decline of, of well-being, the welfare state, etc. You know, how can we... Um, for example, talk, uh, take a, a donation from Uber, who at this uh, during this month alone is fighting a, a court case against the state of California because they refuse to acknowledge drivers as as workers and deprive them of health care and sick leave and so on. Uh, th those workers have to to work overtime just to to pay their their basic bills. Um, so, yeah, again, it goes back to my earlier point of. Are we now looking to philanthropists to fill gaps and solve problems that states should be doing? I think the, the answer uh, is yes, and we need to go back to, to the role of states in, in, in addressing those can issues. I, can, I, can I jump in here and just to yeah. say that, uh, I mean, if states were doing a great job, then you wouldn't really have to worry about uh, philanthropy. But I mean, I think we have to see failures across the board. Uh, we see Absolutely. failures in, in philanthropy. We, I think we see failures in government as well. And, and, uh, and, and maybe what we need to do is to, is to sort of have a better uh, taxonomy of, of uh, where both the failures and the, and the remedies are for these different sectors. There's been an inadequate amount of attention to the philanthropy sector because people, they all want money from the, from, from, from these people. And so they kind of like zip it, like they kind of, kind of like don't say anything. But, uh, 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 and everyone maybe feels like, well, you know, I don't want anyone looking too, too, too far in my backyard, but I mean, I think it, it's necessary. Uh, uh, I think, I think if, uh, patient groups is an example where you see a lot of uh, money coming to patient groups and drug companies, and then you see, a very one-sided position. The, the patient groups are all for getting insurance because that's good for the drug companies and they're all for getting coverage. Uh, and they don't mind lobbying for uh, 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 subsidies for research and things like that because that's also good for them if they, if they need better cures. So they're all working on legitimate issues that are benefit patients in those areas. 
And if you say talk to a patient group and you say, uh, uh, you know, like, should you take money from Pfizer or should you take money from Novartis? They're going to say, yeah, look at all the good that we do with it. But I think that the policy should be, yeah, but you should declare yourself uh, to have to have a conflict of interest on the pricing and the IPR issues because you, you are conflicted. And as long as you don't hold yourself out as a legitimate player in that area, it might it, maybe it would work. But the main reason why you're getting the money from the companies is because the companies do not want you to enter the, the debate in some cases on the pricing issues or on the, on the patent issues. They, you know, they want to sideline you. Uh, and, and even better, they want to basically shape your message so it's consistent with their objectives. So I think that, that, that pushing for, for rules about how NGOs uh, uh, respond to this, this type of funding from either corporations or from, uh, you know, these, 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 these big foundations that are, they're resourced by people like, you know, Dell or Larry, all, 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 you know, all these, all these California billionaires or tech billionaires or things like that. I think that that's needed. Uh, uh, and, 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 you know, it's, uh, I'm, I'm not sure where that we talked about, we did a conference on the Microsoft monopoly when I was working for Ralph Nader in the nineties called appraising Microsoft. And, and then we did a series of conference on what remedies would be necessary in an antitrust setting for Microsoft. And, uh, but th that was really, I think worked out well for us. Uh, it was a long time ago, but it, it, in terms of the competition issues, I think it, 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 was, it was helpful. And I said, well, should we do one called appraising uh, the, the Gates foundation? Should we look at like, basically how do you sort of think about, what the public stake is in the activities of the, of the Gates Foundation or where the accountability issues or something. And frankly, people were terrified of doing that conference. They just didn't want to go there. They, mm -hmm. they thought that was just too, too challenging. In the public health area, if you want a, if you want a career in public health, uh, it, it's, it's, it's not just uh, getting a grant from the, uh, from the Gates Foundation. It's the institutions that you may want to work with. They may be getting money from the Gates Foundation. The universities may be getting money from the Gates Foundation, the NGOs and different things like that. And so if you're like radioactive, if you're basically considered to be like an enemy uh, of, of Santa Claus in, in this area, then that that's actually a, a negative thing for your career path. And so people self-censor. So a lot of the problem you have in the public health thing is just, it's what people don't say. They just don't say anything about certain topics because they know it's not good for their, their career. And uh, so, so it's, it, it really has been a, a problem in this area. It, it actually would not have been such a problem if, if it wasn't dominated by so much by a single institution. If there had been like 20 different tech people funding that hated each other and they were competing against each other, then it'd be fine because if you piss off one, then you could always work with the other ones. But right now, you know, it, it, it's just too highly concentrated for people to feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jen. Uh, so, um, you know, James, what you're really speaking about is is the is hegemony. It uh, we self censure and these uh, processes self replicate. Um, so I see I see th three problems uh, with philanthro capitalism. So the first is the lack of any form of democratic oversight or public accountability. We talked about that. Um, in fact. Uh, the second is that their agendas uh, can replicate forms of discrimination that maintain global inequalities. Um, and this is because they're often driven towards uh, tech, uh, quick technical fix, fixes uh, and not meaningful change. Um, and that the charity obscures and distracts from the fact that the same policies that enrich donors also generate the needs that charities seek to address. So we're hiring the arsonists to put out the fire. Uh, and then the third is that philanthropic capitalism emboldens states to neglect their obligations towards their citizens. Uh, and it occurs on both sides. So the global north uh, is clawing back its, um, its uh, donation commitments because the gaps are being filled by philanthropic capitalists. And the global south, um, in the global south, attention is drawn away from the needs to build good working uh, national governments and public health systems. Um, ironically, I think we see this as uh, a humanitarian problem as well. Those of us that have 
worked in humanitarian projects have probably been pulled our hair out through frustration when we think we're stepping into a crisis to offer temporary solution until the local ministries of health and local governments uh, have a chance to mobilize and take over. But in fact, the opposite often happens. Uh, the perception is, oh, it's okay, this humanitarian organization is dealing with the problem, uh, therefore we can uh, sit back and we don't need to attribute resources, we don't need to mobilize. Um, so I think all this feeds into what has been called a wicked problem. <laughs> so I don't think we're going to solve this uh, uh, through our discussion, but I think it, um, I think the, the actions uh, that we take outside of our humanitarian bubbles may have a more profound effect. So demonstrating, taking to the streets, um, and uh, participating in direct action, fighting for climate justice, uh, fighting for equality, these sorts of things I think will have more profound effect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe, maybe if I could just jump in there um, and, and pick up on your point on hegemony. hegemony. Um, and of course, it's not the role of humanitarians to, to take down global capitalism. That is uh, obviously not what our, our primary function is. Um, but we have to be aware um, of the role that capitalism plays on our own behavior and how plutocrats and philanthropic capitalism are actually creating monopolies um, uh, within the NGO and aid sector itself. So the MSFs, the Oxfams, the Save the Children's, they are in turn becoming, um, you know, they're sucking up all the, all the, all the aid um, that might have otherwise gone to smaller local NGOs. Um, so as, as we grow, the big NGOs, the, the local, the smaller NGOs uh, suffer. So, and I, I, I just like to, to give an example to, uh, about this, um, which is that um, during the COVID-19 uh, fundraising um, drive that MSF did, uh, the UK office launched a small medical program in the UK for the first time ever, um, working with homeless people. And honestly, uh, to me, this seemed very much like uh, NGO flag planting. Um, it was a, a way for a big organization like MSF to come in and say, look, we're here. We're here in our own backyard helping people. Um, but ultimately, MSF treated only a handful of patients and arguably took up space and diverted funds away from smaller um, grassroots organizations that might have actually been able to mount much more successful campaigns and interventions. So I don't, I don't personally think that MSF should have come in there and sucked up the money and visibility on a project um, that might have been much better carried out by somebody else. Um, so, mm -hmm. yeah. I'll leave there. As we have just 10 more minutes. Uh, um, let's think about the, the, the future and next steps. No? Let's say, uh, is it imperative to find a, a global health strategy and relate it completely and relate it to business interests? Or is it possible to find a common path? There are some people in the audience that are saying no, that uh, we want it or not, we are living in a in a capitalist uh, system, no? So we have to deal with it, no? So do, do NGOs have to find, yeah, a global health system, a strategy completely unrelated? Or w what is this common path? What, what are the points of engagement that are we missing? All of you. Um. So uh, I think we're talking about um, capitalist realism here. Uh, and uh, I recommend uh, reading, uh, it's a book by Mark Fisher. Uh, and and uh, he talks about the fact that we're, you know, we're talking about hegemony of capitalism and it, that it has said in our minds this notion that, uh, and perhaps Margaret Thatcher said it best, there is no alternative. And we just can't seem to think of creative alternates, uh, yet they're out there uh, and they're in the, the minds of wonderful people. And we get to these through our collaborative collective works um, and through democratic processes. Uh, and, um, and so I, you know, I think that's why it's so important that 
humanitarian organizations take a collective approach where all voices are heard and uh, and that we, you know, we have neither gods nor masters uh, directing our courses of action because there are brilliant minds. I'm not one of them, but when I sit down with my colleagues, I am just always utterly impressed by the ideas that are coming forward. Uh, and so to me, this is this is where the, the hope lies. Mm -hmm. James? In terms of going forward, um, I, I think one thing that would be interesting would be to have a, a series of, uh, I mean, this idea of doing these video events is really interesting because it used to be really expensive to think about uh, setting up a panel and you have to invite people in person. And there was the plane ticket and the, the hotel room and the venue. It was, it was, it was, it was, you couldn't, couldn't do that much, many of those things. And, and, and who you invite would be sometimes uh, constrained by those budgets, but now you can, people are more comfortable with these kind of events. It's, it's, it's interesting. So maybe it'd be interesting to have uh, uh, events on, on philanthropy relating to this idea of power and privilege and, 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 and philanthropy to sort of looking just at the philanthropy itself, but also not, not, not generically across all activities of philanthropy, but break it up into certain areas. Like for example, health would be one, agriculture could be another one where there's, a, a, I think a significant in, a, a, a difference of opinion about some of the goals that should be achieved in the agriculture sector. Um, uh, and, and I guess people can figure out other, other areas where it, it might be uh, important, maybe consumer rights and digital platforms or privacy, or th there's some other topics, but just sort of uh, uh, people may look at what's happening in one sector and it may ring some bells or give them some insights into what maybe is going on in their own sector, or maybe some of the remedies maybe uh, uh, that, have, uh, that have been been helpful may, it, it may be useful to look at that. Uh, so you got things happening, uh, John mentioned it in the climate change area, the environmental area, and, and uh, workers' rights areas, so I I, I wouldn't mind seeing like a, you know like a half a dozen of these over a year, uh, each, each one looking at a different particular uh, uh, area. Mm -hmm. um, Dalila, yeah, thank you. Um, well, I think absent from this whole conversation has been the, the voice of the people that we, we claim to work for and on behalf of. Um, and so I'd, I'd put the question to them, what do they want and how can how can we as humanitarians um, meet their interests uh, and, their, and their needs as best as possible without necessarily uh, compromising um, on some of our principles? I think um, yeah, I, I think when when we when we take um, our, our medical interventions or humanitarian interventions into countries with money um, that have that has been provided by people who have a stake in in those problems and who are are creating some of those problems in the first place, um, that is is quite self serving. It's it's the self aggrandizing rhetoric of humanitarians, frankly. I think we need to bring in um, the voices of, of those populations mm -hmm. much more into this discussion. Okay, and just uh, as a conclusion, and for many of the people that are listening today and are very interested, and many of them are working in small NGOs, and they are very worried about this issue because they are discussing no, that maybe this is a debate for uh, big NGOs with big budgets, but what, what is happening with a small NGOs that don't have uh, so many options to choose in terms of fundraising. No? As a final, as a final uh, conclusion, uh, what would be your recommendations for these international humanitarian organizations? What would you recommend? John, for example. Uh, thank you, Susanna. Um, the um, I don't. I guess the question is that you know if these if our small organizations are part of a movement, then why do they need philanthropic capitalist backing? Um, 
aren't as aren't movements by definition uh, um, grassroots and uh, and then what are we gaining by the NGOization of um, of these sort of global health crises? Uh, do we need another my NGO, another Mingo? Um, do we uh, who's who is being served by this? Um, uh, Delila has really pushed us to, th to think about the um, the populations that humanitarian uh, sector aims to serve and their voices, and that the fact that um, they are organized, they are capable, they are qualified, and um, and that this is the, the the funding structure that we need, such that the there's local capacity through taxation through just uh, distribution um, of resources, uh, that we acknowledge that every billionaire is a policy failure, uh, that corporations are not in it for our interests, but their own, that they're dangerous, uh, that we have to trust um, and work with through solidarity. Uh, and, and it's a privilege, the, the people, um, that we that we aim to serve, which is ultimately ourselves. Mm -hmm. James, what is your final conclusion and recommendation? Uh, well, I, uh, maybe the uh, Congress could recommend that there be a um, um, a code of conduct uh, for NGOs and a, uh, a, a of a uh, norms that are proposed, soft norms for donors, for foundations themselves, um, that would, we would work toward that. Just to, just, just to make it sort of more pragmatic and practical, what we want to be done is sort of the next steps. Um, it'd be helpful for me, for example, if I could, if I could push back on one of the, uh, one of the, uh, uh, people in the health area that we think is 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 is, is uh, has you know is is uh, doing the wrong thing. I guess if we said that they were they were they were we could look at those norms or those code of conducts as some sort of support for just saying we we just don't like them or we don't like what they're doing or something like that. It puts a little bit more structure into it. Um, the, the problem you have sometimes is sometimes think these things are like personality squabbles or something like that. And, 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 and even when there are more fundamental issues involved and, and, and so uh, trying to put some structure on what the concerns are and what the remedies are, I think would be helpful. So I might start with some soft code of conduct and, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, other, other norms separate from the NGOs receiving the money than the people giving the money, because I think the issues are a little different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I like that, the idea of a con code of conduct. I think, uh, you know, there's no such thing as a, as a free lunch. And so we, we need to kind of clearly um, delineate the, the, the way that money is given and what the expectations are. Um, but clearly, the, for me, the, the issue is that commu the communities that humanitarians serve should not have to depend on big business, on the, the gratuitous uh, philanthropy of, of, of donors. They should be able to live dignified lives without humanitarian aid. Um, and so therefore, big donors need to start enacting policies that enable that, as opposed to doing feel-good donations every now and then to pretend that they care about people. So in terms of going forward, I think uh, humanitarians also need to better define and articulate what kind of donations we take, perhaps through this code of conduct that James has mentioned, um, and how we use that money. So yeah, if, if, we, if we really want to be uh, demonstrating solidarity with, with, with populations, humanitarians need to be challenging corporations and, and plutocrats much more rigorously. Um, Certainly, uh, there's, a, there's a larger problem within the NGO sector that needs to be addressed, how we balance fundraising and organizational growth with the power struggles uh, between capitalism and, and communities. Very good. Very interesting. Well, I don't know if there's uh, something else that you might 
want to say to summarize this session. I believe that we've been through many of these uh, critical issues and there are many other questions that our audience have placed in the chat bar. Many of them we have already uh, discussed over our session, but I uh, deeply encourage you to go through this uh, chat bar and continue the, 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 the conversation uh, uh, in the meantime, while the next session is is open, uh, so uh, thank you, thank you very much for your time and for your attention. Uh, yes, please be aware of the opportunities for networking and continue the debate in the chat bar and the expo space with the participants. You can find on the left bar, and uh, which you are welcome to to use until the next session begins. And uh, thank you very much. I hope uh, you have enjoyed this session and please uh, enjoy as well the rest of this um, amazing humanitarian uh, Congress. Bye bye to you all. And thank you very much, Darila, John and James. It has really been a pleasure staying with you today. We have learned, we have learned a lot. Thank you so much. You have made us think a lot as well. Yeah, it's great for you to, uh, to, to, to listen to the Likewise. other panel members, too. It was uh, quite enlightening for me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.